Welcome to Higher Ed Live. I am your host, Seth O'Dell, and I am here with the man you most likely know, the one and only Ed Cabellid from Bridgewater State University. I don't know if you guys got the intro music or not. I hope so. Uh, that was Hulkamania at its finest. 80s at its best, my friends. That was some quality, uh, some quality wrestling <laughs> intro music. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, as I said, guys, welcome to Higher Ed Live, as you see, in studio special with Ed Cabellan. Yeah, man. I'm excited. Yeah, man. I'm pumped about it. We're talking about building campus community in the 21st century. What does that mean? This is a big macro topic. I'm excited to hammer it home, and we're going to do that. But first, as always, we want to say a quick thank you to the sponsors that make Higher Ed Live possible. So, big thanks to the folks over at Integral. Integral are the creators of the Schools app on Facebook. Be sure to check out their webinar series about how they can help you leverage Facebook to increase yield and retention. That happens this Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, and I'm going to send out a tweet with that link in just a minute if you're interested. Also, big thank you to Omni Update, the leading web content management system CMS provider for higher education. The company's web CMS OU campus is secure and scalable with great tools and features, deployment flexibility, and an awesome user community. In fact, it was the highest ranked CMS in customer satisfaction in a 2010 EduGuru survey. So if you guys need a CMS, check them out at OmniUpdate.com. Big show. Big show. In studio, big music, big topic. This stuff is exciting. We're excited to do it. I'm happy to be here with Ed Cabellan. We're talking all about building campus community, and we're going to get into the weekly five unsolicited shout-out stuff. But maybe Ed, first, just tell you, what are you doing in L.A., man? Let's, let's uh, lay down how this happened, because I don't think people really think you flew all the way out here just to hang out with me. That could have been a rumor on Twitter. But if it was, <laughs> deny that hashtag now. Uh, well, I've been, I've been out here for the last four days with uh, 10 students from Bridgewater State University. We're... All here with the Campus Movie Fest International Grand Finale. It just ended last night. It was a great time. My students are off enjoying LA. For, we're, we're hitting a red eye back to Boston later tonight. And so it just worked out where, you know, Seth and I could finally meet in person. That's right. And uh, we figured why not uh, chat about some important topics and hire while I'm out here and take in LA's beautiful scenery, um, beautiful area. If you've never been out here, really make a trip. LA is actually the real deal. It's awesome. So. That's why I'm here, and uh, happy that we can do this. I'm, it's nice to be sitting on this side of the couch, uh, you know, because I'm used to doing it the other way around on, on my own show, but this is great, so I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome, and I'm happy to have you here, and guys, just so you know, it works the same way every week. You should know it by now, but questions or comments, use the hashtag Higher Ed Live, because we're going to be pulling up what you have to say all night. There's the one and only Mike Petroff showing up there on the thumbnail. What's up, man? Share what you guys have to say, because uh, we care. We're going to be talking all about it. So, we start each and every week with a little thing that I like to call... The Weekly Five. Five stories from around the world of higher education technology that you should think about reading, you should read, you should star, you should promise yourself you're going to get to, and if not, we'll summarize them right now. And that's what we're here to do. So the first... Kind of unconference meets mingling meetup event Friday, July 29th at McGreevy's Bar in Boston. Tons of speakers. Why I'm telling you guys about this today, the link I'm sending out is the full, well, pretty much full speaker list for the event. Big stuff, Friday, July 29th. So that link is out, but so you know, Friday, July 29th is not just the home of EDU Tweet Up. Because, Ed, you got something going on the same day, right? Yeah, man. Same, same day, the Friday, July 29th at Boston University. We're going to have our first Student Affairs Unconference, uh, Tech for Tech. So uh, we have about 55 people registered already. This is as of Friday. We're going to be doing a Boston University, thanks to our friends at BU, Dean Elmore, uh, at Dean Elmore and at Sports Girl Cat on Twitter. Both have been fantastic in hosting this. And so if you're in Student Affairs or, or not, I mean, you're all, everyone's more than welcome to come. We're going to be talking about technology in an unconference format. And give us a shot at really looking at rethinking how we do education at the conference level and learning about technology. Things are very important, I think, right now to start talking about. In the summertime in beautiful Boston, what, you know, can't beat that. So we're going to do our thing from 11 to 5 uh, at BU on that Friday. And then head on over to the EDU Tweet Up and hang out with those folks, too. It's a full day, jam-packed. Hope you can make it. It's going to be great. Awesome. Yeah, I, I'm really excited that they're able to happen on the same day. That's some really exciting stuff. So, you know, guys, do both. Plan the day in Boston, take the weekend if you're not exactly right from the area. 
it's going to be the kind of thing you want to be there for. We're really trying to change the way, as I said, the way the conference system works, the way, the way professional development works. We're just trying to provide a really great resource to people, both of us, and it's going to be just really fun, really, really not to be missed kind of event. So that is the first one coming up, but that's not the only thing we got because it's the weekly five. That's just one. So what's the next one on the list? Well, great post coming out from the one and only Eric Stoller, host of Student Affairs Live, uh, about the web is not print, stop making magazines that flip. And this is his post, which he also links to Michael Finians from EDU Guru, who wrote a great post about it as well, about kind of a backlash against Flash-based magazine, I don't know, sites. With this thing's called like Issue, for instance. It's a magazine where you upload a PDF for like your, your traditional magazine, and then it creates this like Flash flippable document where you can like flip through and read a magazine online. And you know, Eric's post hammers into a lot of the same things that Michael's post does. You know, one is obviously accessibility. Uh, also, search engine optimization, these things don't work really well for either. And it's, it also, his post really is kind of saying fundamentally, when you're talking about trying to present information online, it's not about how did we traditionally do the magazine, can we just put it up online, mm -hmm. but you know, how, how can we actually put the concept in a way that people engage with? So it's interesting because there's a trend that's still emerging in higher ed of people using sites like Issue and using this stuff a lot more. Uh, and Eric and, and Michael Fina both kind of put in posts out recently that we're going to link to. So you're really kind of pushing against that. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, I mean, we, we're guilty. So we're one of those people that made me really think about whether or not we're going to use issue further. Um, you know, a lot of us, we want to, you know, make our print media look really cool. And I think a lot of these sites make it really easy and cheap to do. And so I think that's part of the reason why we've done it. But great points by Eric uh, in this article. So definitely check it out. Yeah, really, it's definitely worth a read, guys. And check out the comment section, too, because it was getting a little fired up. Um, mm -hmm. So always fun to see some fiery comments. So I thought that was interesting. <laughs> Uh, next up on the Weekly Five, UCLA has joined a venture to offer online education to baby boomers, and it's a venture that they're partnering with a for-profit online education partner. Um, I'm going to leave it at that and decline to comment on this any further, but I'm putting the link out, guys. There's a lot going on here. I really would read it. This is an interesting thing if it becomes a trend, and I'm just going to say read this article. It's really worth knowing because this is the kind of thing you're going to see a lot more in years to come, a lot more interesting profit, non-profit partnerships you know, just, I think you're going to want to be up to speed on what's going on, so that's why I'm throwing it in. Uh, next one, great post I saw coming out of you know, University of Chicago Law, it's just saying on who they follow on Twitter and why. And, you know, this is kind of a common thing, but I just thought they did a great job of saying, you know, essentially their rules are, you know, we follow back anyone who looks like a real person, anyone who might be a student or alum or who's interested. You know, they don't follow back people who lock their accounts. They don't follow back companies or brands or things like that. So my question to you guys, and, and I'll ask this to Ed, too, while we're doing it, um, you know, who do you guys follow back on an institutional level on Twitter? Um, you know, who do, who do you say, okay, we'll follow you back, and where do you draw the line with folks that you don't follow back? So it's a question to you guys, and as well as to the man right here. Yeah, well, uh, for our Bridgewater State University Campus Center account, I know that we follow back any student that follows us. We follow all our other partners <clears throat> at the institution level who have Twitter accounts. Um, we, we will follow people who have protected accounts. And so if we can identify, if we think they're a student, now, again, we can't know that unless we follow them and they follow us back so we can see. Uh, but certainly, we we will follow any we won't follow everyone that follows us. But we will follow those who are connected with the institution as much as we can tell, because we all as we all know, not everyone fills out their Twitter account and their Twitter bio properly. So we do the best we can. Um, I haven't I haven't checked that one out. I'm gonna check that one out too. That's a good. Point. That's it's a good point. post. Yeah, yeah. And I'll say something. I do follow back uh, private accounts if I think that they are like someone who's definitely has a relationship with us. Oh, yeah. But it's a question. So if your account is private, do you want an institution following you? You know, I don't think it's a big deal to ask because again, you're just it's pending. They can deny you. Correct. Um, but there's some there's some lines. I think people are different. So it's always good to have a dialogue professionally on where we all draw the line. So that's four. We got five because that's the way we go and that's how we count here. Uh, last one is to a great video that was put out by Catchfire Media and Staymates. You guys know those um, those social media videos that you know have the flashy music and a ton of stats, and it, it shows people visually why social media is so powerful. Uh, the, those two companies teamed up and put out one that's similar, but it's for higher ed. So I'm going to play you a quick clip. I'll see if this works, and you guys can just check it out for a quick second, and then we'll come back and talk. <laughs> flashier and cooler than, uh, than us, but I just want to show it because um, it's a great asset. You know, when you're trying to have these conversations on campus with folks, especially folks that maybe aren't as familiar with technology, maybe they're not as passionate about it, 
Um, you know, it's always great to have those kind of things like a link like this to send somebody where in a couple minutes maybe you can win them over a little bit or open up their eyes. So I sent a tweet for that, guys. That's just the kind of thing that I like to keep in my back pocket for when I'm having conversations with folks in case I need to pull it out, show a bunch of stats and make it look, you know, flashy and cool. People like shiny things, so. It's a lot like the social nomics videos when we were looking at it earlier, so I, I think it's great. Any, anything you can have in your back pocket video content-wise to show people why this stuff's important, use this. This is awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So that brings us to the unsolicited shout-out of the week where I shout out any person, place, thing, or idea. Why? Because this is my show, and that's what I get to do. <laughs> this week's shout-out is going to Read Media. Great, great higher ed company out of Albany, New York, because on Sunday, July 24th, I'm in Albany, and they are hosting a special higher ed live with me. Uh, I'm going to be there with Rachel Rubin, the one and only. We're talking about rebranding in higher education. Guys, you want to be there if you live remotely near Albany. Read Media is going to host us all at their headquarters. We're all going to go out, have a nice little kind of like mingle, drinks, hangout session afterwards. It's just uh, really, really cool. So, guys, thanks to Read Media. They get my own solicitor shout out this week. And uh, if you're near Albany, you guys got to be there. So that brings us to the topic that we are talking all about today, which is building campus community in the 21st century. So, uh, you know, guys, obviously this is not the kind of micro-technical show that we usually do on Higher Ed Live. This is going to be a little bit different, a little bit more conversational. And I wanted to do the show specifically because of where we are in the academic calendar year. You know, we're entering summer. For the most part, all of us have wrapped with our commencements. You know, the kind of the academic year has come to a close. And as we look back and think about where we are, I want us to think a little bit beyond our own job descriptions, a little bit beyond our own projects, and think about the big picture of where we fit in the broader campus community and what our campus community is as a whole. Uh, I really think as we're entering the 21st century, things are changing a little bit. Students aren't always in the library the same, or in the student center the same, and student, staff and faculty you know, are not getting the information the way they used to. And I just think it's, it's everyone's responsibility to understand what is campus community, what are we all working for, what's our collective goals, and what's our personal responsibility in that. And, and more importantly, I just want us to really think differently and get kind of excited about what campus community means in the 21st century. Because we have some potential opportunities here that folks didn't have 20 or 30 years ago, obviously. And I want to talk about that today. I wanted to bring on Ed Cabellon to talk about it because he's, he's on the forefront of stuff like this. And it's going to be a great chance to have this kind of conversation and hang out. So, uh, guys, please, it's, again, big picture stuff. Throw out your questions, comments, and uh, let's dive right in. Uh, so, Ed, as we get in first, you, know, you already told us why you're here in LA. Just yeah. tell us a little bit more yourself and what you do, uh, just to give a background to this conversation. Yeah, sure, today. thanks. Uh, well, I'm director of the Rondelow Campus Center at Bridgewater State University. I've been there for over five years. I'm going to my sixth year there. And my job really is to build community. And, you know, and that sounds really weird coming from a student center director, but I think those of us who work in student centers, student unions, can appreciate that comment because the student center has always been sort of the living room, the hub, and it's funny, the living room concept I think is moving away a little bit because this generation of students really don't use the living room the way I think I used to use it, the way some of our you know, staff out there used to use it. Um, their living room is now their bedroom uh, where they you know, will, will be online and doing things or they, don't have, they just can't grasp that concept. And so as a, as a student center director, campus center, student union, whatever it is on your campus, my role is always thinking about how am I positioning staff um, and our students to make sure that we're providing a great place where community can happen in person. And over the last three years, thinking about how technology has changed, social media has changed, now moving on to creating community online. Because really, when you think about everything that's happening in higher education, it, you can't avoid the fact that um, community is never, it's not going to be just oh, this one thing in person. Um, thinking about the makeup of your students and everything else, you really got to consider the online community. And so now, we're asked to do more, as we are with everything else in our jobs, to do more with less. And so the, the definition of campus community, I think, is, ch is changing. Um, and again, it depends on the campus that you're on, of course. But I think, generally speaking, um, it's no longer just the in-person, which I think we all strive to do. But the reality is a lot of, the, a lot of these students aren't coming to our facilities mm -hmm. anymore. So um, I'll start with that. So. Yeah, and it's a great point. When you think about campus community, I think a lot of us think, you know, physically, uh, you know, student affairs officers or people like in the library working one on one with students or with faculty or staff. But really, you know, community is both online and off now. We're going to be talking about this today. But what that means is do you work in web marketing? You know, do you work in communications? Do you work in student affairs? You're all part of campus community. Because if you're working with the web, that's where people are getting information. That's where a lot of their relationship with your institution is. Mm -hmm. And that's what community is, is all about is relationships. And that's why this conversation really is going to hit home where wherever you work at an institution, Community building should be in your job description. I know it's not physically, but it really is, and you're going to see why today. So, 
you know, we're going to talk all about that. Uh, and we got a first question coming, and we'll make sure to get to this. You know, can you address building community on big commuter campuses too? We have 25,000 students, 100% commuter. Wow. I mean, I, I, I can appreciate that because Bridgewater is definitely a commuter campus with, you know, a little over 11,000 students full-time enrolled, um, only about three, you know, 30, 3,500 live on campus, and we're expanding shortly. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that, it's sort of my perspective on that too. I mean, we're, as a commuter campus, for sure, we have to tr make, make, our best efforts to try and connect with those folks who physically just are coming to class and leaving, um, and they may be going to our academic facilities, but not coming into our residence halls. Um, they might be grabbing a bite to eat quick, but once they're gone, they're gone. And so it's, we're just missing opportunities, I think, to build that alumni base, to build that brand, and have those people be our best stewards after they graduate. Because at that point, it's just, oh, I, I got a degree from Bridgewater, but you know, it, it didn't really connect. And student satisfaction, retention, all these things that we already know about, are going to be important. So when you're thinking about, geez, I mean, a hundred, a hundred percent with twenty-five thousand. I mean, that's what a daunting task. You're, there's going to be a blend there of of of, of in person and online because without you have to do it. And we hear it all the time. We don't have enough staff. You know, I, I'm not comfortable with this. Or um, you know, we have we have uh, structures in place that aren't supporting the, the what we want to do. And you may have great ideas, but maybe not the structure. And so. All of that play, it will play into it, but really just start small and finding something that works for your campus you know, initially. Great. And when we're talking about this, it's probably good to step back and, and briefly, we all know this, but, but define, you know, why is campus community so important? Like, mm -hmm. what are the goals? Like, why does this matter? Why is this discussion there? And I'll say, you know, from my view, and then you can say yours, you know, the first thing I think is, you know, obviously, what's your mission statement? Why do you exist at all as a university? But at the end of the day, broadly speaking, what we all exist for is, is to find, to bring in quality people, students, to educate them, to empower them, to go out and change their lives and change the lives of others and make the world a better place. Cheesy or not, that's what most schools are trying to do. Mm -hmm. Change the world through education. And community building is about building an environment that helps that. I mean, the, one of the main reasons I see is, is just retention rates. You know, one of the main reasons students drop out is because they don't have a supportive network of people. Right. And that can be built, whether it's a supportive network of staff or just friends, or even if it's a, you know someplace online to be able to connect with people, so broadly speaking, I look at campus community as a way to simply support the people that are on campus, bring more people to campus, and, and have them have a positive experience and leave connected because ultimately the other thing is, you know, relationships with institutions should be lifelong. It should not end with graduation. Right. And I, I think in student affairs, that's, I mean, one of our main focuses is making sure that people feel like they matter um, and that students feel like that they're part of something bigger than just their classes. Because I think if you look at those who are really successful in their collegiate experience, they can, they can, remember back to something that was just you know beyond their, their academic classwork and so when you look at the broad big picture from start to finish from admission from the admissions process all the way to the alumni you know to the alumni and sort of making sure they're part of that community you have to start right away from from, from even from your marketing and admissions perspective because once they get a sense for who you are as an institution either you know in, both in person and online that will carry through, that should be a consistent message throughout. And so you may have a great marketing and admissions message now and you get them in and you do a good job, but what happens when they get to campus? What happens when they go to orient, your orientation program? What happens those first six weeks of school where, which is so important for first, for first year students, if they're not feeling engaged and feeling a part of something, then you're, you're gonna lose them. And so we need to do a better job of making sure that happens. And so um, I think, the reason we do it is because we have the, the all of us have a stake in their in their from their birth of, you know from getting to college to, to graduation and beyond because they're going to be our best stewards and our and, and, the, and the people who are going to talk best about us and so um, I know that it's hard because it's not part of everyone's job description but I think in the climate and the te technological information age that we're in mm -hmm. it's time for us that all of us start thinking about it absolutely and we have a great comment coming in already so connecting is even more difficult with online only students. And that brings us to really kind of the first main point question of tonight's show, which I really think is, you know, how has the entire idea of campus community changed over the past, just say, like five to ten years? Like what, what is the shift that's happening? Yeah, I mean, the online learning piece is huge. I mean, the, the fact that they are not, more, more and more students are physically not on our college campuses, I think needs to be sort of this alert, this alarm this to all of us in, who work, even as, fac as faculty or as staff, to, to rethink how we manage and how we do all the work that we do and not just thinking about the people that are right in front of us. Because that's a very, that's a shrinking population of the people that we're actually influencing and working with. 
Sure. In student affairs, I think some of the events we do definitely touch a broad, a broad picture, a, you know, a broad scope of students. But I, I do believe that the, this inside the last five to ten years, I worry that student affairs. I wonder how student affairs will react and, and redefine how they do things when I can't physically talk to them in person. Um, you know, and it's and I see things. I see people being innovative all the time. I mean, even from academic advising, doing Skype appointments. You know, so that mm -hmm. they don't have to physically come in, or you know, thinking about social media and, and blogging and other things that they do to connect. That has been the, the fact that they're not physically coming to camp. I think has been the biggest shift. Um, we have a lot of folks coming back from military duty who are coming back to learn. We have a lot of adult learners coming back. Um, you know the, the comment about the baby boomer um, education. So, I mean, all of the, the I think the who is the today's college student is changed. I, I don't think we can say eighteen to twenty four anymore as traditional. Um, and what is traditional now? And so I think we need to step back and think what 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 is it, what is happening up to the to the traditional college student, and also think about um, the fact that really. Now, if we don't do this now, I mean, higher ed generally is about two or three years behind in, in the tech realm. Imagine what's coming next, you know, and um, I, want, I want all of our colleagues to be on a, a similar page. I can't, I can't say the same page, but on a similar page. So. Okay, okay then we have a, when we're talking about how do we do it online, there's a couple things. First thing I say is when we get in this conversation, I hate to break it to you guys, there's obviously no, there's no goal in taking. There's no one thing that's going to make this work. Right. And I think it's going. To, this conversation is going to come down to fundamentals, which is what are people's needs, and then how can we address them. But you know, this is what we're moving into right now. And I want to pull up a great question, which is just coming in, which is just saying, you know, Ed, one of the challenges I face with working with a scholarship program is communication. They're not responding to their email. <laughs> so what do you do when you're trying to reach someone via email? And, and I'm going to let you answer that, and then I might have something to add. Yeah, yeah. Course. I, this has been a real, uh, this topic, I, I get to visit a lot of college campuses um, uh, just just through speaking and consulting and doing some other things on the side that, I, that have the, I'm, I'm blessed to do. And that question keeps coming up about how do you manage communication with students when email is the official form of communication for the institution, yet they don't care. They're not going to go check it anyway because eventually if they really need to know, someone's going to tell them, either a friend or a colleague. You know, or they'll see it's a post about it on Facebook or something like that. And so they're not as apt to really use email. And so, number one, I think the institution really needs to rethink how they communicate with students and be more diverse in their, in their communication style. So not just email, but really opening up, a, you know, a Facebook, a, a, a Twitter, uh, a blog, other ways that they, you know, that they will communicate. And thinking about what about text messaging, you know, we'll, doing the opt-in texting, you know, all of that. I know some, I know some institutions are doing that as well, but email just can't be the only way you communicate with your students. And I know that there should, and I'm hoping there's a shift soon that our staff members feel comfortable with um, friending their students on Facebook. And I know that's some taboo for some of you out there, but if you really leverage what Facebook is and understand the lexicon of what Facebook is. You can leverage the, the, the list functions and, 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 and privacy settings to really make sure that, I mean, I, have a, I, I do a friend uh, uh, my students on Twitter, I mean on Facebook, and really the reason I do that is because I do more business over Facebook mail than I, than I ever do over email because they don't check their email. And if I want a real quick response, I either have to send it over Facebook messaging or a text message. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know if that's the answer you're looking for, but I know that a diver, diverse communication platform is going to be needed, um, you know, just as the fax machine, you know, I know some of you still use faxes out there, and I know some of you use, um, you know, other forms of communication, but I, I believe that we're going to have to really diversify to get stu meet students where they are, I mean, really what it comes down to. Exactly, that's a really good point, and, and being in more more places all the time, you know, the two things I'll say about that, one is, a, is it just a fundamental comment on email, which is, is the email you're using only institutional? And the reason I say this is because more and more students aren't using their institutional email. Why? Because they're already coming to campus with an email. It's amazing to me that we're now moving to this trend where you can apply online. And students that apply online a lot of times have to use their own email address associated with their application. Yet, when they come to campus, we, they're told, you have to switch to our email. Right. And they already have an email. Now, five, even just five or six years ago, when I was first applying to go to school, well, geez, that was a lot more than five or six years ago. I'm feeling old. But when I applied to go to school, <laughs> you know, I didn't, I mean, I had an email, but like, I was, oh, great, I can have an institutional email. I'll take it. Now, right. the kids that I talk to, are saying, I don't use my institutional email. So that's a really good point that, you know, is it an opt-in for what email? And the broader thing I'll say, I don't want to put the burden on, on the person I put the question in because this is a tough thing to do. Absolutely. But find the students in your program, pull three, four, five of them out, and just talk to them for 10 minutes and say, where do you get your information? Where do you want information? Because if the information you have is relevant to them, 
then they'll tell you where they want to hear about it. And maybe it's email, but maybe we're sending too much email so the good stuff can't rise to the top. Or maybe they do want it on Facebook or they want it, you know, other places. It's not that easy, but I'll say that, you know, I, I surveyed some of our students uh, and found that a lot of them didn't use Twitter and they weren't interested. And then I knew, okay, Twitter for us is more about external audiences. Clearly our internal, that's not an area where they rely on it as much. But that's different for every institution. There's still schools that are having success with MySpace, for instance, which is a little mind-boggling to me. But you know, <laughs> there's but where wherever your audience is. So I would just say, you know, if it's not working, ask the students what would work, and that does, probably means pulling out three or four that maybe you have some relationship with or know, and just really ask them about how they consume information. Because I'm finding that there's even a gap, very much so, between myself, someone who I think is tech savvy, and, and the way that you know mm. students that are coming through our doors are consuming information. Mm. Um, so that's something I, I definitely think. Great question. Yeah, for a really, really good question. So moving further, talking about how you build uh, campus community online, I, I think you know, one point that you made is really it's, it is multi-platforms. It's, you know, if you're trying to build community online, you have to start where people are. Like a fundamental mistake that a lot of alumni organizations make, I think, is they build closed private alumni social networks. Right. And then they ask their alums, hey, come to our network and log in and sign up and be part of us. And I have yet personally to find an example where that worked in higher ed. If you know of one, guys, honestly send me. I'd be interested to know. Yeah. But the alumni communications, just as an example, that are working are saying, where are people? Are they on LinkedIn and interested in professional development? Okay, are they on Facebook? And if they are, do they want to be part of a Facebook group for their class to get custom information or part of a page? So I think it's really about addressing, you know, where is your audience already online and meeting them where the conversation already is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I... When you think about um, your, I mean, and all of you are going to have a, a different sort of approach to this, um, but for me, I, it's it's hard to say the what what in terms of a broad based definition because again, I think all of you are dealing with, um, you know, shortages in funding, support, resources, information, knowledge. I mean, everyone's coming from this very. I think those watching today have a little bit of a, you know, I think there, I think you, all of you have an idea. But when you think about your colleagues, and again, this goes again to the building community piece. I, I think now is a time where I, I hope all of you are starting to feel a little more comfortable with the technology, where you're starting to teach other people in your in your department, in your division, how to use it. Because even though you may not think you're an expert, I guarantee you you're more than an expert than, than the, some of the folks in your areas. And so we we all know we can't afford to bring people in to do all these things. So you're going to have to take the initiative to watch shows like Higher Ed Live. And, and and to read blogs and to and to self and self teach because without that sort that sort of community education of each other we're never gonna know enough to be good enough you know and so I, I don't know I I don't, I don't know that's that's just yeah. my point to that so yeah no I think it's really good you know I really do think again be online be where they are but you know one of the points I'll say about building campus community online is start with what you have physically you know building campus community online is gonna take time. But you already have great stuff going on on campus, don't you? You already have events going on. You know, this is going to be something I'm going to probably talk about a couple times today. But a simple one is if you're already putting on your events, why aren't you live streaming them? Why aren't you opening these events up to your online audience? One Step one for building online community could be taking physical community and finding a way to share that story online and bringing people online in. You know, a simple example is, you know, I've live streamed lectures before where we'll actually live stream it. We'll tell alumni around the world, you can be part of this lecture even though you're not here, and then we'll take their questions. So all of a sudden you have an expert on campus. This is still happening. People are in the room, but they're answering questions online. And now, I will say that's only step one because all you're really doing is taking what's physical and putting it online, but that's still something. And I think that's a good step of saying, where are, what do we do have on campus that's already going on? Can we go take photos of an event and post them on Facebook and let people tag themselves? You know, what can we at least start with? And I would say start with what you have physically at least and go online. And then from there, I mean, you have schools that are doing virtual open houses or virtual reunions and people come in. There's some really cool examples of stuff that you can do that's online only or, or in person only. But I, I think blending the two is a great start. Yeah, and I would say use your students too. And I know some people think that's taboo as well to actually have students manage your, your social media profile, your professional, yeah, your department social media profiles or, or live streaming events. But really some of those students are going to be your best allies in this because they're familiar with it, if they're taking classes in it. I mean, what a great way to build that out-of-class experience for them. You know, how we built our social media platform at Bridgewater was we use students. And at first, people were looking at us funny, but I mean, they, they, they really do a fantastic job. In particular, with the video content, you know, we learned lessons this year. Our video stuff wasn't as great as I, what, what I would have hoped, but we learned along the way that short, quick video is probably where we're going to start. I, I had these grand ideas for live streaming and everything else, but it just didn't work for us in, in, our, in our facility. So for me, it was more about let's do quick 
interviews of people at events, ask them how it went, and have and sharing that experience. And so the more you can create sort of what's already happening online, as Seth said, um, and using resources that are at your disposal, and just really thinking about it differently. And, and to speak on that further, thinking about how you market all these events, not just your standard, what you've done with flyers and with, you know, whatever you have used, your, your, the, um, the TV screen in, in your building or in your, in your residence hall or in your student center, but really rethinking how you market to people because these students receive so many marketing, I and mean, we all do, marketing messages every day. What's going to make it stand out for them? So it, it, it's almost like we all now have to, be, have, to th have this sort of hat on where we're not just doing our job, but how are we marketing our, that, we do, that we're doing our job? And how are we um, you know, connecting with these people in, in a diverse platform? Yeah. And, and as we're talking about doing like, you know, online communities and in-person communities, I think it's really important to make a note that, that they are not you know, one or the other. That you're talking about online only communities, which could be an online student that never comes to campus, or it could be an alumni that lives you know halfway around the world and will never come to campus. In person community could be a student that's on campus or a faculty or staff member on campus, but also could be someone who's on campus that's getting information online. The reality is all members of our campus communities, for the most part, are consuming information online. So it is not like you have an online audience and an in-person audience. You know, we're talking about one audience. I think that's a conversation that people miss a lot of times with community building. Is mm -hmm. it's not let's go send this to people online and let's talk about it in person, but it's like let's how can we have this broad dialogue across, as you said, multiple platforms. Mm -hmm. And just like you have a dialogue, let's send out emails or Facebook. It's also in person and it's online at the same time. It's one conversation. Yeah, I, I think we were just so stuck in this like community is. And all you know, in, in, I feel like in higher and always will be this that whatever happens in person. Yeah. Um, because I mean, really, that's what we've known. I mean, our human history up until the, up until what 10, 15, maybe twenty years ago now, has we've lived in this, you know. And so now to re to rethink that, you know, that whole you know, I remember when people talk about second life and how like how can someone have an online life and you know create this this avatar. I mean. P there is something to be said about having an online identity and and, li and living. We all live part of our lives now. Well, not, I shouldn't say all. We many of us live our lives online as well. And so, our, we know our students come to come to our campuses already with built-in communities from Facebook or Reddit or built in, or, or LinkedIn or whatever they're using when they come to campus, um, MySpace maybe. Um, and so, we need to think rethink how the term community is because I think we. You know, for some of my colleagues, and I used to, and I, I have been, I have caught myself in that mode of thinking that um, I say on, online and in person. Well, maybe we just need to think about community as just community and think about how are we, how are we accentuating and how are we including the folks who are online as part of this community. Absolutely. So I'm going to skip around a little bit. What I want to dive into is just talking about some examples of sure. what does, you know, what does building community in the 21st century look like? Because I think as we're having this conversation, I think it's really good to point to some tangible examples. And I'll say that you know, there's no institution that's doing this perfectly. And I don't think it can be done perfectly. This is a growing thing. That's going to always be a situation you have to address. But I think there are some places that it's doing really well. So, you know, one example that I'll give you that I think is a great example of building campus community is the University of North Texas College of Music. Mm -hmm. uh, they started last fall live streaming all of their concerts on campus. Mm -hmm. Now, they already put concerts on on campus. And why do they put them on? Clearly, the students need to perform, sure. but also people want to see the performances. Other people from campus, people from local community, parents want to come, so they'll put them on an auditorium, and they'll pack an auditorium with a few hundred people, and this is a positive thing. Well, what they started doing last fall is they started live streaming all of those concerts. They did 30 in the fall alone, and they only spent $1,000 to do it. But what they did is they had 100 thousand people watched those concerts and those people didn't just watch there was a chat room on the side where they could talk with people they actually people in the concert halls on their phone be able to respond in the chat rooms you know they had parents watching their kids be able to perform when they couldn't otherwise do it prospective international students be able to watch a performance live and chat with people it got to the point where if a parent was watching their child perform they could send in the chat room my student plays the piccolo and this is where they sit and the camera operator would be directed in the earbud to actually move the camera and zoom in so the parent could get a close-up. I mean, That's cool. it's so cool. And this is just one example where they took something they were already doing. This was a great campus community building tool on campus. People would come, see the concerts, they would talk, they would mingle. And now you have this amazing online component where you have all your alumni, your family, your international students, your prospective students. Oh, yeah. But it's not online or in person. They're all sharing the same experience. They're all part of the same event. I just think that is one really good example you know, of building campus community on campus you know, and online. Mm -hmm. One, one example I'll share is, uh, of course, my, my good friend, uh, Dean Elmore, Ken Elmore at Boston University. 
and uh, this this spring he challenged the class of 2011 uh, to really do a good job on their senior class gift and really make a difference. And he challenged them by saying, if 20, if 2011 people, he did a YouTube video, if, 20, if, if 2011 of, of, of the class of 2011 uh, gave, gave a donation, that he was going to jump into the Charles River in Boston, which for those of you from the Northeast know, it was freezing. <laughs> in, in, you know, even in May, it was freezing. And he did a YouTube video, a YouTube campaign, and, and talked about it. He got an alumni group to to donate a hundred thousand dollars if they made that if they made that goal, and so through social media and online community and building community both online and in person, he was able to to they hit the goal and he was dunked and he he jumped in he had a suit on I think it was a tuxedo actually, um, you know floaty and 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 about I, I forget what he said to me when I was with him but maybe a few thousand folks were up along the Charles mm-hmm. the banks of the Charles watching and cheering and I mean what a great use of social media to to really connect people around a common goal and um it was met i mean everyone was so excited because they felt a part of that so boston university big ups to you guys i i think that's a great example guys we'll, we'll try to tweet out links in a minute to those videos if you haven't seen them because yeah. it is just a great example of taking something where it's a common goal it's a shared interest and they built community it didn't matter if you lived there in person or not this was broader stuff and this is the thing guys if that exact situation was happening 10 years ago, the best you'd get would be a photo and a, and a letter or a photo and an article in the uh, you know, the magazine that's going to come out four months from now. So alumni would see it plop down or maybe they get a solicitation that was a physical writing. This is going to happen. Send the check. It's not the case anymore. The potential right. is there to be so much more. And that was a really engaging, great use you know, by Jane Elmore to do that, to just engage everyone. And I loved it. I thought it was really exciting. Clearly, if we care about it and we're not paying attention, we're not even part of their community, right. you know it's working. Um, you know, the example I'll just say is at UCLA, one thing that I'm, I'm proud of, this is not something I'm, I'm involved with, but our staff staff assembly, uh, live stream staff assembly meetings. So like, we'll have a staff assembly where maybe the chancellor or someone else higher up will come and they'll talk to staff. And this has been a tradition going on for years where they'll come and talk about the budget or other main issues and directives on campus. And this would be a way to kind of pull us all together, understand what's going on, what's, what's going on in our culture, what are our directives. Um, but now they're live streaming all those. So if you're really busy, even just on campus, you know, or for folks that maybe are working from home or some folks don't work at location, you know, you can pay it, you can watch and ask questions from anywhere. And it's a simple thing, but it, you know, again, if you're putting on the staff assembly and you care about your staff getting information, being able to ask questions, then you want to go the extra step and make sure that wherever they are, they can do that. And I think that's a great example uh, by UCLA that they're doing that. That's awesome. Yeah. And um, oh, oh, one other one I'll, I'll shout out is uh, Generation SUNY is just a really exciting thing going on by, oh, yeah. by you know, State University of New York. You know, they have this huge strategic mission going on that I just think is amazing. They're really setting their sights on putting, you know, a strategy in place and measuring success. And the whole time they're talking about what's our actual, you know, strategic plan for the entire SUNY system, you know, they're putting out blog posts, they're putting it out on Facebook, they're putting it out on Twitter. They're soliciting that anyone, any on any campus who wants to participate can. And this is a kind of broad conversation that could so quickly get lost in the Chancellor's office behind closed doors. Mm-hmm. And I just have to say that to you know, Generation SUNY and, and to the folks at the SUNY Chancellor's office, like, you know, great job by actually saying, you know, we're going to still go around to campuses and talk in person, but we're also going to put up blog posts, so we're going to email this out to everybody. They, I mean, it's a great example. Again, at this stage of development, they used almost every channel available. And I think maybe that is a good testament that right now, if your audience is, is, is spread out and diverse, so should your communication strategy. Right. And, and the one way you... That you have to to know that you have to do assessment. You have to ask, as Seth said earlier, sit down uh, with the people in your in, in your ecosystem and beyond <clears throat> to find out what they are using. Because I mean, you don't want to also be taking shots in the dark and hoping that you hit. I mean, you really want to do some assessment ahead of time. And again, it takes time. It, it does take a little bit of effort. Um, but really, that da- that data that you collect will definitely be helpful as you as you move forward. Yeah. So you know, and again, we've mentioned this before, but talking about. As you build community, not thinking of it as online and in person, mm-hmm. but you know that building community, building campus community in the twenty first century just means building community regardless of where people are. That doesn't matter how they're receiving your information, whether it's in person or if there's a screen in between you, and that can be challenging. And and uh, and I'm going to ask a little bit about how do you do both at the same time, a little more like we're talking about. But I just want to give one cool example while we're on the topic, which is mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Southern New Hampshire University this year live streamed their commencement. Uh, and they also were able to put up, you know, Twitter dialogue and all this other stuff. But, you know, that's great, and that's what we're talking about. But the cooler part, I think, was the dialogue. That what their president did was on the podium 
you know, during his like, second sentence, intro and commencement, he said to the folks in the arena, I want you to know, the, I want you to know the folks that are here today, you are not alone. There are people watching online from this camera in the back. And he sold this story of telling people, like, if you're watching online, you're here today and we acknowledge you. If you're in this room, understand that you are not alone. There are people watching online. And I think when it comes to building, you know, campus community in the 21st century, Right now, one of the big things is going to be about dialogue. It's about not speaking to one and then to the other, because that's not building community to divide your community into two pieces and approach them separately. And I think that was a great example of someone in a leadership role understanding that community is one whole thing. And uh, regardless of online or not, I just got to give a shout out to that too, because I thought that was a great example. Yeah, I think for us, you know, when, when I talk with colleagues and think about the whole notion of the in-person and online piece, for me, it's just about thinking, how can I already do, I mean, it, I think it's overwhelming for folks at first when we have to think about do, adding something, doing something new. And, you know, initially when we first started using, uh, the, you know, using technology, we were just literally copying the, the questions we were getting in person. So I'm sure most of you have, you know, a main line that, you know, people call into your office, right? They're going to call and ask you questions. It happens, right? Well, we would then put those questions and answers on our Facebook, on our Twitter, because if one person had that question, I bet you someone else had it too, right? So initially, if you're thinking about what kind of content am I going to be sharing to help build this community and build content, start with what, are, what the questions you're already getting. Start with some of the things that you know that maybe you overhear as you walk your halls or as, as you walk your facility. Because if you hear those questions, our information center, we, we try and put that stuff back out because we know that that's the stuff that people are interested in. So for me, don't, don't try and do this, don't, don't try to do something big at first. I mean, really focus in on what you're already doing and think of the best mode to really mimic that online. And maybe it's Facebook, maybe it's Twitter, um, maybe it's something else, maybe it's a blog. I mean, I, I don't know, maybe it's a video, maybe it's a YouTube channel. For each and every one of your campuses, it's gonna be something different. But you won't know until you start trying it. So, yeah. That, and then and we talk about that. I think it's important to think about value too, because we had some great comments coming through the Twitter stream earlier about, you know, oh, we're getting so many questions from students on Facebook, and, and for some folks it might be hard to keep up. Mm. You know, this is a really good point though to talk about how do you value online versus in person. And again, it goes to the fact that you need to value community as a whole, because you know, if a student walked into your office and, and knocked on your door and asked you a question, how fast would you answer it? Pretty fast. Right? So if they're asking it on Facebook, yes, I understand it's a little more passive. Yes, I understand they might still be in the dorm room. But generally speaking, shouldn't you still attempt to answer it with some of the same energy and tenacity as you would if someone was you know, face to face with you asking that? Right. And I mean, uh, I've heard people say, well, you know, I get to my voicemail when I get a chance. And I get to my email, I'm in meetings, you know, and that's why it takes more than you to manage this. And so thinking about it, not just what, what do I have to do, but thinking about what do we have to do and who am I going to be have as a part of this team so that <clears throat> really when you look at your approach, it's not just, geez, am I going to get back to this fast enough? It's going to be... Well, I know someone will because I'm not the only one listening. Yeah. So, and that brings up the point that you know, ultimately, one of the takeaways today is going to be really tough. Is you know, is is the fact that this has to be obviously some this conversation on a leadership level, and that's why when you do see people like Dean Elmore or someone like like SNHU or or, or Generation SUNY, these are examples of leadership level consideration of, of community as a whole, online and in person, and those are examples of leaders understanding you know really understanding community building in the 21st century. But I don't want people to be feel disenfranchised if that's not the case at their institution because you're moving in that direction and I promise there's going to be a shift. So so stay confident and lead by example no matter what you do. But you know try to bring this up. You know be the evangelist for this stuff. If if anything you're going to be an evangelist for on your campus, be an evangelist for your community. I mean more than any one piece of technology or tool. I mean believe me, I've been the guy who's been like the YouTube guy before. Like I'm the guy who pushes for YouTube and that's really great and I love that stuff. But make sure, too, that you're also the person that pushes goals, not just the tools. And this is just the kind of thing where, I mean, we should all be behind this. Even if we're going to be going down swinging, the only person in our office for the next six months, people will catch on. They'll understand as they start to learn that this isn't just one tool or two tools. This isn't, it's not about the tools. It's not about even Facebook or anything. It's about if you care about community, you care about delivering the best possible way to engage with them, build community. And that's going to be on different platforms. Yeah, and... For me, when you think about the, 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 broad, the broad opportunities that all of us have now to really make, to influence, and not, it's not even just with, I mean, our campus is definitely where we start, but when you look at the influences that MIT has made, you know, with their, you know, bro opening, up their, opening up their walls and saying, all right, you, you want to see what we do? Check it out, you know? And I, 
when you look at the, the, the type of students that are coming into our, to our universities now, we can no longer ignore the fact that um, this is a different student and we need to start meeting them where they're at. And so the notion of that this stuff's going to go away or that we can still get by with doing what we've always done, I don't know. I just I wonder how long, how much longer can we last doing that? And so we have a responsibility to build this, build communities on our campus. Yes, micro in our own way, and how and how the things that we have responsibility for. But how can we connect with other people to really look at how does this all work together? And so don't. Oh, I, I would hope that I mean some of this might be overwhelming for some of you or your colleagues if they were to watch this later. Um, but really, it's challenging this summer. And this is the summer where we're going to be challenging a lot of each other, not just those who get this, but those who don't get it, to think differently and to make sure that we're not complacent, even in the things we're doing now, on how to get community built on our campus. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and this is exactly why I want to talk about it now as we head into summer. This is the kind of time for most of us where we have a little bit more breathing room to brainstorm, to think differently. Mm -hmm. But let's just, let's just play this out for a second. Let's talk about what's going to happen first for you guys in the fall, right? You're going to have orientation. Okay. Every opportunity is an opportunity to build community. Why aren't we sharing the orientation experience with alumni? Simple, simple examples, right? Go on Facebook, send out an email to them, whatever you want. Tell alumni, go either to our website, we have a guest book, or go to Facebook. Leave advice for the incoming freshman class. Here's a chance to engage your audience, which let's not, let's be honest, guys, maybe we're going to ask them for money in six months, or around Christmas when we send that ask, you guys know? You know, engage them now, but also build community so they can connect. I mean, there are some institutions, I really wish I knew the name. If you guys know the name, Hit me up with this. There was at least one institution I read about recently where they actually connect the alumni class that's either 25 or 50 years out previous to their freshman class. I can't remember. Oh. And they actually have that alumni class almost adopt the incoming class oh, as cool. a way to build co uh, the community between current students and alumni. And again, if anyone knows which school it is, let me know. If not, I'll pull that link out soon. But it's just a great example of somebody who was actually uh, an institution that was saying, we're going to build community and we're not going to leave out people that maybe left our institution 25 years ago. Because again, you know, when you're a part of a higher ed community, there's no expiration date unless the institution sets it. You know, if we forget about you and we stop reaching out to you, I mean, yeah, you can shut it down, but if people have a good experience, they want to be a part of it. You know, so I just think, keep that in mind, coming into the fall, there's going to be a lot of cool opportunities. And I would say, in coming this fall, I would say, if you're getting re resistance on your campus from, you know, upper level, like talking about leadership, right? I mean, this fall, as we look, look to the fall, if you're looking, if you're getting resistance, oh, I don't know if we want to do that, or, you know, the, they're still not on board with social media, ask them to give you a, you know, a trial base, three months, you know, six months, and have a plan in hand when you go and talk to them. Because I think it's hard for some folks to conceptualize how this would look unless you bring them examples from schools that we, we talked about today, and maybe other colleagues at other campuses that you see they're doing a good job. But as you think about this summer and think about planning, Create, create an identity for you, you and your department and, and your organization to find out, all right, well, and find out what your institutional communication folks are doing, because they may have a plan. And so let's start talking to one another about it. You know, ask them on a temporary basis if they're still a little, oh, I don't know about this, uh, and just and go for it. Because you, you may think they may say no, but this is a time I think you'll get more yeses than no's if, you, if you're prepared, you have a plan, and you have a way to assess what you're trying to do. Absolutely. So, you know, guys, as we're wrapping up the show today, talking about building campus community in the 21st century, uh, let's do a couple final takeaways. You know, uh, what do folks need? You know, my final takeaway, guys, is just to very fundamentally this summer ask why. Ask why for everything. Why are we putting this on the website? Why are we reaching out to students? What is the goal? As you get down to the goals, I truly believe if you can have that conversation with your with your office, with either your employees or with your employer, with your boss or your staff, you'll find that these things answer themselves. Mm -hmm. That what it what leaves is the door open to say, how can we think creatively? Here we have this great, we already have this great asset. There's so many great assets on campus. For instance, the University of North Texas said, we have these great concerts. How can we open them up? Mm -hmm. And then they were thinking about the tools. So I wouldn't say, I mean, you can start with, okay, Facebook, or start with using Forum Spring for Q&A, but start this summer with the fundamentals and asking questions, because I promise you, it'll be very easy to identify the right tools if you have the right questions first. Yeah, I think for me the final takeaway is really understand your own students' behaviors and, and sort of what they're into. Because again, it's really not about the technology or the tools, but it's going to be about you know where they're at and the things that they're interested in doing. You may have you may be on a campus where may they, they may not have access to smartphones because of who, who the culture of the students are. I think sometimes we get stuck into this like, oh yeah, everyone's got a smartphone, so yeah, we should be developing apps. And it's like, well, if your campus and your makeup definitely has that opportunity, then great. But you know, making sure that we're thinking about who your students are, where they're at, and what will what what how you can meet them best, really. And so that 
it's easy to get caught in the tech because it's cool, it's shiny, mm -hmm. uh, and it's fun for sure. But without really understanding the fundamentals of what they need, you know, going back to Maslow and their hierarchy of needs, mm -hmm. I would imagine that you'd have to start there before even getting into the other stuff. And so think about that um, because. The tech and the education is there for you, whatever you need, whatever you, I mean, this show is great for that and there's others out there. And so I would say the learning is there, but make sure you ask those questions and make sure that you get to know who your students are and who your community is before you start figuring out how am I going to connect all these pieces together. Yeah. And then the last thing I'm going to say, a lot, a lot of questions about online learning, you know, if, if so many students are online, this is probably not the answer you want to hear, but if you want to build community, just try. I really think that a lot, just try and learn as you go. You know, if you're, most of your students are online, okay, try it. How can you do something? Email, Facebook, whatever you need to do, if you talk to them and see what they need, community can be built even from scratch. Right. You know, it just takes some real effort. So just try and learn and grow with it. Absolutely. Okay. And, and there might be ways on your campus that faculty are already using this to build, the, you know, some faculty are using Facebook, you know, in their classes. And so, again, it's going to take research. Who on your campus is faculty-wise are doing that because they're going to be your gatekeepers to sort of the knowledge of how are they connecting online. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's where I would start, especially with those. If if you're completely online university, you know, if you're an online university, or if you have a good segment of your population is online, um, then connect with the faculty who are teaching the classes. Ask them what they're doing, and then invite them to actually be a pilot and part of your as a part of your area, and just say, do you mind if we connect with those students? Because I want to see if this works. And you never know unless you ask. Great. Well, guys, that's just about gonna just about excuse me do it. So first off, Ed, thank you so much for coming on Higher Ed Live. It's been great to hang out with Thanks, you. Thanks, man. Hey, just so you know, the caffeine drip is still in. It's working great. <laughs> this guy consumes more caffeine than I've ever seen. It's awesome. <laughs> yep. Got to stay energized for you guys. Uh, and speaking of staying energized, I'm going to be staying energized, but unfortunately not with you next week. It's 4th of July. I'm actually going to take a Sunday off. I hope you guys are okay with that. So I am back next. I am back next, Sunday, July 10th, with Andrew Cariega talking crisis communications. Guys, this is going to be a great show. Crisis communications is a huge topic. We're talking serious on-campus on things like, honestly, the campus shooter, natural disasters. There's been a lot of things going on. We're talking about crisis communications and how social media needs to be implemented in that. There's a lot of schools that are still not implementing that yet. And let me tell you something. Even if your institution's not, they're going to wish that you had a plan in place and brought something to them now because things are changing. They're evolving fast. It's going to be a great conversation. I'm really excited. So that's coming up on Sunday, July 10th. As I mentioned, Sunday, July 24th, I am live in Albany, New York with Rachel Rubin. Good friend of mine. Very excited about that. And then don't forget... Uh, guys, and finally, again, thanks to our sponsors, Interval, the creators of the Schools app on Facebook, and Omni Update, the creators of OU Campus, the best CMS in higher ed. So, finally, guys, HiredLive.com's got everything you need. So does Ed Cabellan. <laughs> Had a great time, man. Thanks, everybody, for watching, and thanks, Ed. Yeah, we are, man. Thanks for having me. Have fun out there, everyone. See All you right. later. See you guys in two weeks. Take care, and don't forget about me. Happy 4th of July! Happy 4th of July, Woo! guys. Take care.